Romans chapter 10. Verse number 14. The Bible said Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not heard, not believed? I'm sorry. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And sh how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now the Bible said in verse number 14, How shall they hear without a preacher? And the Bible said in verse 15, How shall they preach except they be sent? I want to preach tonight a few minutes on the subject. It's preaching time. It's preaching time. Now we have, we meet to worship. We have the offering. We pass uh, the offering plates. We start usually with some sort of song, some singing, and some fellowship. And then somewhere along the line there will be some announcements made and some things said and some plans put forth to the congregation. Then the offering plates are passed. We'll pray. We'll sing a congregational hymn and the offering plates will be passed. And then usually right before the message there's some sort of uh, youth choir special, choir special, uh, solo, trio, quartet. Somebody will sing a special just before preaching. But the p plates are passed and, the, and all the singing's done and everything. And boy, I appreciate that stuff. And that's a, that's a part of worship and it's good and I enjoy it. But buddy, after that offering's plate's passed and the last special song is sung and everybody's seated, the most important part of the service arrives. It's preaching time. There's nothing more important than preaching. There's nothing about worship that's more important than preaching. I mean, when everything's done and it comes down to that final moment, the most important thing begins to unfold. It is preaching time. I like what somebody said here. They said uh, they were looking for a... Uh, a, con a, a pastor. This congregation is looking for a pastor. And it said, uh, we do not have a happy report to give. We've not been able to find a suitable candidate for this church, though we have one promising prospect still. We do appreciate all the suggestions from the church members, and we followed up each one with interviews or calling at least three references. The following is our confidential report on the present candidates. Adam, good man but problems with his wife. They're looking for a pastoral candidate. Noah, Former pastor of 120 years with no converts. Prone to unrealistic building projects. See, nobody's fitting the bill. Abraham. Though the references reported wife swapping, the facts seem to show he never slept with another man's wife, but did offer to share his own wife with another man. <laughs> you know your Bible, you'll get these. Joseph, a big thinker, but a braggart. Believes in dream interpreting and has a prison record. Moses, see none of these guys fit the bill. That's the way the preacher is. He can't win for losing. Moses, a modest and meek man, but poor communicator, even stuttering at times. Sometimes blows his stack and acts rashly. Some say he left an earlier church over a murder charge. David, the most promising leader of all until we discovered the affair he had with his neighbor's wife. Solomon, great preacher, but our parsonage would never hold all those wives. Elijah, prone to depression, collapses under pressure. Elisha, reported to have lived with a single widow while at his former church. Hosea, a tender and loving pastor, but our people could never handle his wife's occupation. <laughs> Ain't that good? You read your Bible, you get a kick out of this stuff. Jeremiah, emotionally unstable, alarmist, negative, always lamenting things, and reported to have taken a long trip to bury his underwear on the bank of a foreign river. <laughs> Isaiah, on the fringe, claims to have seen angels in church, has trouble with his language. Jonah, Refused God's call into the ministry until he was forced to obey by getting swallowed up by a great fish. He told us the fish later spit him out on the shore near here. We hung up. Amos, too backward and unpolished. With some seminary training, he might have promise, but has a hang-up against wealthy people. Might fit in better in a poor congregation. John says he is a Baptist, but definitely doesn't dress like one. He's slipping the outdoors for months on end, has a weird diet, and pr provokes denominational leaders. Peter, too blue-collar, has a bad temper, even has been known to curse, had a big run-in with Paul in Antioch, aggressive but a loose cannon. Paul, powerful CEO-type leader and fascinating preacher. However, short on tact, unforgiven with young ministers, harsh and has been known to preach all night. <laughs> Timothy, too young. Jesus, had, a pop had popular times, but once when his church grew to 5,000, he managed to offend them all, and this church dwindled down to 12 people. Seldom stays in one place very long, and of course he's single. Nobody fits their bill nowadays, huh? Judas, 
His references are solid. A steady plotter, conservative, good connections, knows how to handle money. We're inviting him to preach this Sunday. Possibilities are here. <laughs> That's exactly what would happen in a modern, average modern day church. If they went through the candidates of all the apostles or folks in the Old Testament, they'd wind up with Judas Iscariot as the best candidate for their pastoral search. I guarantee it. But I tell you what, I thank God for his preachers. I'm a preacher and I ain't ashamed to be a preacher and I thank God for that. And they used to ask me when I was young, I was in school and stuff, they said, what are you going to do when you get out of high school? I said, I'm going to preach. They said, no, we're talking about what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to preach. God's called me to preach and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to preach. I'm going to, whatever I have to do, if I have to stand on the street corner, I'm going to preach. And uh, they didn't understand that, you know. Ever, uh, listen, all I've ever wanted to be, all I've ever desired to be since the day God called me to preach is a preacher. I'm not ashamed to be called preacher. That's all I've ever wanted to do is just rear back and preach and be a preacher. Now, uh, the preacher is referred to as God's man, and I thank God for that. Uh, never be ashamed, young men, to be called preacher. You don't need doctor after your name. You don't need reverend. You don't need something like that. Never be ashamed to be called preacher. I'm glad God called me to preach. I like to preach. And it is preaching time. Paul was a preacher. The Bible said in 2 Timothy 1.11, wherein too I am ordained a preacher. Noah was a preacher. 2 Peter 2.5, Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, was a preacher. Ecclesiastes 1.1, the words of the preacher, the son of David. Philip was a preacher. Acts 8.12, but when they believed Philip, when they believed Philip preaching these things. John the Baptist was a preacher. Matthew 3, 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Jesus was a preacher. Our Savior was a preacher. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I like this in Matthew 4, 17. It said, from that time Jesus began to preach. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, was a preacher. Isaiah was a preacher. Isaiah 61, 1. He hath anointed me to preach good tidings. I'm going to tell you something strange I bet you didn't know. David, the man after God's own heart, David was a preacher. Here's what the Bible said. And when I studied this, I read this verse, Psalm 40, verse 9. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. David was a preacher too. I thank God for his preachers. Preaching, everybody listen to me now. Preaching is important. Preaching is the most important part of the service. Preaching is the most important half hour of your life during the week. Hear the man of God preach. And I'm going to say this right now. And I ain't saying it to make nobody mad. I want all you young folks, you teenagers, look up here at me. I'm getting sick and tired of you talking while I'm preaching. I'm tired of you looking at each other and mumbling and talking and passing notes while I'm preaching. I'm tired of it. And you're going to stop it. I mean, it's rude when the preacher's preaching. If I pour my life into it and I spend hours praying and time putting sermons together and spending my life putting together, I don't get up here and preach and put those sermons out there so you can sit back there and talk and be rude while I'm preaching. Preaching's important to you. You need what the preacher's saying. You need what comes from the Word of God. You need what comes from the pulpit. It's time you stop talking. Stop making faces at each other. Stop making eyes at that girl or boy across the church there and stop passing notes. Listen, hey, if you're not going to be quiet and you're not going to listen, keep your mouth shut while I'm preaching, why don't you stay at home? It won't do you no good. You just disturb somebody around you. You'll bother somebody that needs the preaching. You might even hinder somebody that's lost and need to be saved. So either keep your mouth shut or stay at the house and listen while the preacher preaches. Preaching is important. It's very important. When it's preaching time, it's listening time. I'm going to tell you, I've said this over and over and over. It's a quote I've said over and over. What this old wicked world needs is preaching. This world don't need some new seminar by somebody. They don't need a new tape. They don't need a book. They don't need some new direction. What this old wicked world needs is an old leather long preacher to get up and open the Word of God and preach what God said and preach the Word of God and straighten this world out. So preaching. It's preaching time. Now, why is preaching so important? Number one, preaching is God's chosen method of saving the lost. Look one book over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you to see this. Number one, preaching is God's chosen method of saving the lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 17. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Look at verse number 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You can have your little teaching ministries all you want to. Have your little seminars and stuff like that. But you're going to have to cut 1 Corinthians one twenty one out of the book. The Bible said it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It's God's method to get people saved by preaching. God does not choose singing to get people saved. You can have all the gospel singings you want to. Have all the big groups in you want to. You can put all the most 
emotion and feeling on people you want to and sing all the songs you want to and that's not God's chosen method. Ain't nothing wrong with singing. Singing's okay. And somebody may get saved listening to singing. But I guarantee you there's some preaching somewhere in the background that put the Word of God into their heart because God didn't choose singing. God didn't choose programs. It's alright to put on a play. It's okay to have a play. Let people come and see that play and use it to reach people. But God didn't choose programs to get people saved. God didn't choose singing. God didn't choose films. God chose preaching. It's God's way to get people saved. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You sat somewhere under conviction one night and some old preacher got up and preached your heart off and the Holy Spirit of God convict you and you went to the altar and got saved by the grace of God. God chose preaching to save the lost. People looking for a church a lot of times. I've had people call me and they're looking for a church or flag me down looking for a church. They say, preacher, we've been looking for a church somewhere. And they'll say, what kind of music program does your church have? Whoever calls me, man, I think people are retarded for asking stuff like that. Somebody call me up and they'll say, Preacher, I'm looking for a church. Just had a question for you. What kind of music program you have? Man, i got a radio at the house. I ain't concerned with a music program. They say, What kind of ministry do you have for the children? That's not the question. If I was looking for a church, you know what I'd do? If I was looking for a church and I moved to some town somewhere, I'd pick up the phone, I'd dial up the phone, the, pe- the, the preacher would pick up the phone, I'd say, Preacher, I'm looking for a church somewhere. I want to ask you a question. Do you preach the Word of God, the King James 1611 Bible, do you believe it? And if he said yes, I'd say, well, I'm going to ask you something. Do you get up and mill around and talk with mush in your mouth? Or do you let her rip and preach? That's what I want to know. I don't care about your music program. I don't care about your youth program. I don't care how many folks you got coming. I don't care about how much money you got in the bank. Do you preach when preaching time comes? Do you ride back and let her rip and preach the Word of God? That's what gets people saved. That's what God chose. That's how God meant for it to be. He wanted somebody to preach so people get saved. That's what my family needs. That's where I want my family. That's what I need. Their best chance, listen, your family's best chance to miss hell. The best chance your children have to stay out of hell. The best chance your mom and daddy has to stay out of hell. The best chance your relatives have. The best chance your neighbors have. The best chance they have to stay out of hell is preaching. That's the best chance they got. It ain't some new tape. It ain't some new program. It's preaching's the best chance they got. Get them under some preaching. Get them under some word. When well, a man of God rears back and lets a rip and preaches the word of God and don't care what people think, preaching's what God chose to get them saved. Abraham Lincoln said, I like to hear a man preach like he's fighting a swarm of bees. God told Isaiah, said, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Not a flute. Trumpet. Too much flutey preaching going on. We don't need no flutey preachers. He said, lift up your voice like a trumpet. And he said, show my people their transgressions and the house of Israel their sins. He said, preach on sin. Preach it straight. Preach it hard and preach like a trumpet blowing. Preaching brings conviction. Where there's no conviction, there's no conversion. And preaching brings conviction. That's why God chose it. Matthew 3, 1 to 2. In those days came John the Baptist preaching and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, John the Baptist came out of the wilderness like a wild man with fire in his eyes, and he was preaching, Repent! 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 And those people didn't know how to take it, but the old preacher was preaching. And more according to reading the Word of God, there's a lot of folks fell in behind on John, got right with God and repented under the preacher of the Word of God. I don't want somebody to tell me what I want to hear. I don't want somebody to set my family down. Hey, my family's in another town. I don't want somebody to set them down and tell them what they want to hear and tickle their ears. I want my mom and my dad and my brothers and my relatives. I want them to sit under some old-fashioned preaching. And I want the preacher to get up and peel their hide. I want him to tell them what's right. I want him to tell them the truth. I want him to let it rip and preach hell hot. I want him to dangle folks out over the flames. Let them feel like they're going there and preach it so they can get saved. I want my family and my relatives in the hands of a real preacher. That's what I want. Matthew 12, 41. They, talking about Nineveh, repented at the preaching of Jonas. Oh, Jonah went over and preached in Nineveh and those folks repented. Why? Because there was some preaching going on. The twelve in Mark 6, 12 said, the twelve disciples, and they went out and preached that men should repent. Oh, you think about them disciples running over there, touching people on the head and healing them, doing all those miracles. But the Bible said that they went out and they preached that men should repent. They walked down the streets and screaming, Repent! 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 That's why people wanted to kill them. That's why they wound up killing them. That's why every one of them died a martyr's death. Because they're preaching, Repent! Repent! Hey, if you love somebody, that's the kind of preaching you want them to hear. And if you want right with God, that's the kind of preaching you want to hear. You want somebody to run back and just tell you like it is. It's God's chosen method. I heard some nutcase. I've heard two or three people say this. Well, good singing's as good as good preaching any day. You're a nut. I ain't never heard a song in my life that was in a million miles of a good preaching, burning hot sermon. Never in all my life. Singing will tickle you uh, fancy there a little bit. It'll make you feel good. And 
a little, a little good on the inside in two or three hours you'll be over it but I'll tell you something preaching stick with you a lifetime you'll hear a sermon it'll change your life stick with you buddy preaching's what the world needs God chose preaching to save the lost number two why is preaching so important it's preaching time number two preaching exposes sin let me tell you something you can't sit nobody in here can sit under old fashioned hellfire brimstone damnation preaching and live like a devil you can't do it we have folks come in somebody runs to me and say preacher do you know them do you know what they do do you know what kind of life they live? I say, don't worry about it. They say, why? I say, don't worry about it. Don't you know how wicked they are? Oh, don't worry about it. I'll tell you one thing. Just a few burning hot sermons and they'll either get right or they'll get out. They won't stay and live like they're living. Hey, good preaching, real preaching exposes sin. And you'll either get right or you'll run out that door and you won't come back. It exposes sin. See, what you're supposed to do is go in and sit down in the, in the seat in church in the pew. And we used to not have padded pews, but God's blessed us. We got a bigger building, padded pews, and nice carpet and all that stuff. And you're supposed to be able to sit down in that pew and have to squirm the whole time the preacher's preaching. Not because you got back trouble, not because the seat's hot under you, because it's hot coming from the pulpit. And you ought to be able to sit there comfortable. If you're living in sin, doing wrong, living like the devil, it ought to make you squirm in your seat. You ought to want to do something to get right with God. Preaching exposes sin. I remember one night I goofed up. I done something wrong, I got right with God, and I sinned. I mean, it's bad too, and I wouldn't want nobody to know what I'd done. I goofed up. Say, preacher, what is it? I wouldn't want nobody to know what it was. I goofed up. I went to church the next morning, I sat down, and there wasn't no way under the sun the preacher knew what I did. But I thought he did. Because he got in the pulpit, dropped the barrels on that old double barrel spiritual, dropped both shells in it, double up buckshot, and shut the thing on it, and went boom! Boom! And I said, how does he know what I did? It ain't been 12 hours, and he knows. He told me exactly what I did. Exactly what I needed to do about it. And I thought, man, he is following me around. He knew what I did. He didn't have no idea. But there's 500 people in there and they didn't have a clue what he was preaching about. He was tearing my hide up and I thought, why don't you let somebody else have it a while? He was eating me up. You know what that is? That's preaching. I have people all the time, it's funny, they come up to me and say, preacher, you got a camera at my house? I say, no. They say, you, you know something. Who you been talking to? I don't know nothing about nobody. That's what preaching does. Preaching exposes sin in your life. That's why when the preacher's up preaching, you think, man, how in the world does he know what I'm doing? I don't have a clue what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing. I don't want to know what you're doing. All I want to do is preach, 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 and let God take care of the sin. Preaching exposes sin. Preaching, if it's the right kind, will make you mad sometimes. It will. Preaching the right kind will make you mad. Oh, John the Baptist come out of the wilderness there and he was preaching. And he went in that old camel's hair, biting off a grasshopper's head, eating locusts and wild honey, you know. And he walked in there where King Herod was. And he, old Herod was shacking up with this old woman. And he said, he pointed his old bony finger, all them people standing around there, and that old preacher, he began to expose the sin in Herod's life he preached. The Bible said he came out of the wilderness preaching, and old John never let up. He pointed his finger in that old boy's face, he said, it's not awful for thee to have her to be thy wife. Boy, you could hear a hush fall over that congregation. Oh, Herod went to squirming up there on his throne. The preaching done coming on getting to him now. And that old woman got so mad, she's gritting her teeth and she wanted to kill him. It's making them so mad they couldn't stand it. And he was just absolutely peeling hide. You know what they done? They had his head cut off. That old woman had his head cut off. And you know what? Here comes Jesus, and Jesus is preaching and doing all kinds of miracles. And you know what happens to Herod? The first thing on his mind, <gasps> John's back. That's what he thought. Read the story. I mean, Jesus come through our preaching and He's preaching like John the Baptist. He's peeling hide. I mean, old-fashioned Baptist preacher letting her rip. And He comes through there preaching and He said, John's back. He's back from the dead. Hey, that old boy couldn't even sleep at night after having John killed. That woman, they'd lay her in bed and toss and turn. And I, I imagine they seen that old, old head of John the Baptist blood running out of his neck sitting on that silver platter. You know, they'd wake up in the middle of the night look over in the room see if it's over. And there's an old preacher's head, old rough beards, you know, and stuff. And they'd see visions of the night see his head. And, and his mouth would open on that platter and he'd go, it's not lawful for me to have her. Ah! Then we'd come to the other night. She'd say, I thought we killed that preacher. I can't get away from him. We, we buried him. We cut his head off and he's still preaching. If you cut my head off, I'm going to come back and preach. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do they have my funeral roll me down front. You know, it's going to be solemn and all that stuff. They're going to open the casket. I'm going to be there cold, just, just cold as I can be, dead hammer. And they're going to have my big preaching Bible. I told my wife, I said, put my preaching Bible, big big red uh, outline preaching Bible, put it right out here under my arm, just like that, you know. Open it up to a good sermon outline, peel or hide while they walk around. And I'll be laying there and dead in the casket. Everybody's going to line up and come around through there. And somebody just hated my guts. They're going to walk up and look at me one time. I guarantee you, God's going to let me up my mouth and say, Get out of my God! I'm going to shut my eyes like that right there. And they're going to grab them and wheel them out of there, you know. It's called the EMS. God let that pray. You can't kill a preacher and stop him from preaching. 
Oh, John the Baptist, man, come back home and deal. He was preaching his head on that platter and he's just letting it rip, you know. I can see it now. Hey, preaching exposes sin. And it'll expose sin in your life. I mean, it will expose sin in your life. If you want the best chance your kids have of living clean, get them under preaching. Say, preacher, I don't know what to do with my kids. I don't know what... I'll tell you what to do. Get them out of some preaching. If you want them to live clean, if you want to be a virgin when they get married, if you want them to stuff drugs, if you want them to stuff alcohol, get them out of some preaching. It's the best chance they have. Hey, I'm the one that's going to tell them what premarital sex will do to them. I'm the one that will tell them what venereal disease will do to them. I'm the one that will tell them what alcohol will do to them. I'm the one that will tell them what drug addiction will do to them. I'm the one that will tell them what sin will do. Hollywood won't tell them. The advertisements won't tell them. The school teachers won't tell them. But the preacher will tell them what sin will do to their life. I'll tell them how to wreck their life. I'll tell them how to destroy them. I'll tell them how they'll lay awake at night and cry their eyes out. I'll tell them what sin will do. If you want to get your kids right, if you want the best chance they got, get them under some preaching. There's a woman came to our church. Her and her two daughters came to our church regular. Daughter sang in a youth choir. They left. You know why they left? They said, he's too strict. He's too strict. That's the same kind of folks that call me back in three or four years and their kid's in drug rehab. And their kid's locked up in jail. Or their kid's 16 or 17 years old fixing to have a baby and not married and can't raise a baby. And they call me back and say, preacher, what do I do? I'll tell you what you do. You get them under some preaching while you still got a chance. You get them under a preacher when they're 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 years old and let the preacher preach to them. Let the preacher make them mad. Let the preacher step on their toes. Let the preacher make them go home and dig and see if he's right. Let the preacher make them go look and see what's right and what's wrong. Hey, get them under some preaching the best chance they have and expose the sin in their life. I want the preacher to tell me where I'm wrong. Don't candy coat it. Don't compromise. Don't candy coat it. Don't put sugar on it. Tell it like it is. Just run back and tell it like it is. Preach the devil out of me. I like hard preaching. I got some tapes at the house to make some of you pass out if you listen to them. I like hard preaching. I'll tell you something, son. Whoever you are listening anywhere, if you can dish it, dish it out, I can take it. You preach on anything you want to. If you get it out of that book, you dish it out and I can take it. You ain't going to run me to the house. You ain't going to make me flip out and go mad and go wild like I've seen some people do. I ain't going to storm out the church door. If you get it out of that book and you preach it, I can take it. I don't care what it is. I don't care how you put it. I don't care how you put it. I can take it. Somebody said, you might preach me the altar, but you ain't going to preach me the house. Put it out there. Preaching exposes sin. It's preaching time. If the preaching at your church, we got folks visiting, we got other folks been here for a long time and not members of our church, members of another church. If preaching at your church don't bring conviction over sin, it ain't real preaching. If preaching don't bring conviction over sin, it ain't real preaching. Acts 14, 15. We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from those, uh, vanities unto the living God. Second uh, Timothy chapter 4, verse number 2. The Bible said, preach the Word. You know what's in that Word? Sin after sin after sin after sin. Wrong after mistake after sin after problem. It's in that book. And he said, preach the Word of God. You've heard me say it. By the way, you young preachers surrender to preach. Don't goof off. You preach. Amen. Don't you get you one of these little teaching ministries where you stand up and go through a lot of stuff. I'll beat you to death. You call yourself a preacher. You go out here and you preach and you run back and you open that book and you have everything. You give them everything you got. You load both balls and you shoot them with it. You give them everything you got. You preach. I, I told you about I was preaching revival in Ohio last spring. This big old fella came one night to hear me and he drove about, about an hour to hear me preach. He listened to me on the radio every Sunday. You heard me say it. And he came out to hear me preach and I preached, got through and he came up to me and I said, I wanted to meet you, preacher. And uh, he said, uh, I like you. I just want you to know I like you. So I listen to you every Sunday. I've recorded every message you preached on the radio. I recorded off the radio and I like you. I like it like it is. He said, but preacher, i got to tell you something. My wife don't like you. <laughs> he said, she won't listen to you. She don't like you. She said, he said, here's how she describes it. She said, this is neat. She said, when you feed chickens, he said, she said, you, you gently scatter the grain. And the chickens slowly come in and they begin to eat and feed. And you scatter the grain. And she said, this guy that you listen to on the radio, he loads it in a shotgun and shoots it at you. That's what he said. He said, she don't like you. I said, I appreciate the compliment. Ain't that good? That's preaching to expose sin in your life. That's the way it's supposed to be. Both barrels wide open, double out buckshot. 1 Corinthians 2.4. Here's what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 2.4. This ought to be my last verse, but it ain't. 
My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. They told old Paul in the Bible, they said he's rude of speech. Paul, the greatest Christian ever lived. They said he's rude of speech. He's rude and he's mean. No, he's a preacher. He just tells it like it is. Number three. It's preaching time. Number three. Preaching changes lives. Preaching changes lives. Preaching will change a person's life. Preaching will change homes. Preaching will change schools. Preaching will change churches. Preaching will change counties and countries and towns and cities. Preaching will change mom. Preaching will change dad. Preaching will change a son and a daughter and a family. Preaching changes lives. Preacher, America is so corrupt and it's so pagan and it's so godless. What in the world we do? How we fix America? Preaching would fix America. I'm not joking. I'm not exaggerating. I'll tell you what would fix this old country. Preaching would fix America. I'm talking about good, straight, hot preaching. I'm talking about replacing them talk shows with preaching. I'm talking about getting some perverted nut like Jerry Springer and set him down in a little old metal chair. And then get uh, Jenny Jones and set her down right beside of him. And then get Oprah and set her down over here too. Poor little Oprah, set her over here. And then go over here and get you uh, some other nut like that and, and, and just line them all up in little, little bitty metal chairs and line them right together. And get them in a little room where it echoes real bad and it's real acoustical. And line them up. And get a preacher with a King James Bible. And get him up just real close where they can feel the spit. And line them up and let him open that Bible and for three hours peel the hair off their head. That's what they need. Jerry Springer can't take it. Jenny Jones can't take it. Oprah can't, Rosie can't take it. Oprah can't take it. They can't take it. Why? Because that would fix this country. And it'd fix them too. If they'd take heed to it. Preaching changes lives. Could you imagine you're watching a, watching a program on, on TV at 7 o'clock in the evening? And there's this little thing. Uh, comes on the screen, a little beep, 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 beep thing. All of a sudden the screen changes. And there's a guy sitting there in a, in a suit. He's got a big King James Bible in his hand and it says this. We interrupt this broadcast, this regularly scheduled program for a few minutes of barn burning, devil fighting, sin killing, hell fire and damnation preaching. Hope you enjoy it. Click and go right to the preacher and he just, ah, just wild eyed letting her rip. And do about 30 minutes of that and then say, now we return, we, we return to our regularly scheduled program now in progress. <laughs> and then all about two or three hours later, we interrupt this program to bring you some barn storming, barn burning, devil fighting, hell firing, damnation preaching. Hope you enjoy it. For about 30 minutes, boom, 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 boom. And then say, now we return to our regular scheduled program. Bet you the regularly scheduled program would change. And the beer commercials and the whole mess. Say, what to solve the problem? Preaching. Preaching, preaching. It changes lives. Preaching changes lives. I tell you what to stop teen pregnancies and school killings and drug abuse by teens. Preaching. Preaching to get the job done. Preaching. It's preaching time. Last of all, says I'm done. Number four, preaching pleases God. Amen. You know what? This is what's neat. First Corinthians one twenty one. Read it a while ago. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Speech ain't foolish. If a guy gets up and he's real dignified and he makes a speech, nobody looks at that as foolish. The president gets up and gives his inaugural inaugural address. It's getting rough now. I'm stuttering. I've been preaching too long. Or he gets up and gives his State of the Union address or whatever he does and he speaks and people cheer and they clap. Nobody looks at that as foolish. Now what would they think if President Bush got up there and he said, I'm going to give you what the State of the Union is. And he rared back like that. I don't tell you what's wrong with this wicked country. People would flip out. We would have a major democratic death. Wipe out the Democratic Party. Gone. You say what? They'd, put it, they'd lock him up. They'd put him in a straight jacket and put him in a round room somewhere, lock him up and replace him with a vice president. Why? Because it's foolish to this world. It pleased God by the foolish preacher. I'm going to tell you something. You may not like a thing I've said. good preaching. Preaching. Man's running around behind the pulpit and he's preaching, he's slobbering, he's screaming, he's kicking stuff over and God looks down and says, Gabriel, come here a minute. Look, look. Look at that nut. Look. Oh, ain't that good. He says, where's Michael? Where's that, where's that angel at? What are you goofing off again? Come here. Come here. He calls him over and says, look. You see that guy down there? Sweat all over his suit, sweating through a t-shirt and a shirt and a tie and a suit. 
burning up, standing up there and sweat running down his face and all them crazy people sitting there watching him. And he's screaming, look, I like it. That pleases me. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. For, uh, Titus 1.3 says, But hath in due time manifested His Word through preaching. It's preaching time. Each service we have singing. We take up an offering. We have specials. We have fellowship. But the most important time is preaching time. Ain't got no preaching. Ain't got no service. It's preaching time. God's going to hold you accountable with how you listen. Young people, when it's preaching time, God's going to hold you accountable for how you listen. He's going to hold you accountable for every note you pass to a buddy while I'm preaching. If I see it, I'm going to get it and read it to the whole congregation. He's going to hold you accountable for how you listen. You know what else He's going to do? He's going to hold you accountable with whether you distract others around you or not. Because it's preaching time. It's God's time. It's His ordained time. It's preaching time. And God's going to hold you accountable with what you do, with what you hear. It's preaching time. You know what preaching does? Preaching, not only does preaching please God and expose sin, not only is it God's chosen method and way of saving the lost, but you know what? Preaching will change your life. There's rebellion built in every single human being. And when a man gets up and begins to preach, and he begins to tell you where you're wrong, and he begins to preach your hide off, there's a rebellion that swells up inside of you saying, I ain't going to take that. It swells up inside of you and you say, man, I ain't listening to that. Ain't nobody going to talk. And it swells up inside of you. I ain't taking it. And I'll tell you what you do. You make a choice. You either say, God, that's your method. It's preaching. It's in your book and it's right and I'm wrong and I'm sorry and I repent now and I'm changing. And God begins to bless your life and it begins to work in your life and it begins to dump the blessings on. Or you say, I ain't taking that. God says, you reject that, you reject my method. And the blessings of God don't come. I want my family to be preached to. I don't want them entertained. I don't want them necessarily to, to just enjoy going to church and like going to church and stuff like that. I want somebody to preach to my wife. Boy, she needs it. <laughs> but I want somebody to preach to her. I want her to hear a screaming, leather lung, spitting, slobbering preacher. Guarantee you one thing, when I put preaching in my tape player, it's rough. I need it that way. Why? Because I mean, I need it that way. It's preaching time. What you do with the preaching? Young person, God will hold you responsible. Mom, daddy holds you responsible. What do you do with the preaching? It's preaching time. Let's bow our heads for prayer.